Baruchot Abaot, ladies, and welcome to another edition of our weekly Torah classes. Whether you're logging on to Torah anytime or to ohelsara.com, we so much appreciate your dedication and devotion to learning, especially now during the three weeks that it's so important for us to engage in spiritual matters and in corrections and tikkunim, like we discussed in the previous classes of uh, titled 522, 528 hours of uh, correction. Um, today we are going to continue part four of the Emuna series titled God is Good Even When I Feel Bad. In the last class, we saw and learned about some of the things that trouble us concerning Hashem's interaction with us and how in actuality we learned that instead of condemning Him, we should really examine our own actions, dafka, because we were bestowed with free will. And we learned how that free will can lead us to make the wrong decisions in life and how those wrong decisions can lead to sin. And how as a result of that, we can bring various uh, nisyonot and difficulties upon ourselves. We came to the conclusion uh, that each of us has to be objective enough to determine where we went wrong, to recalculate and examine our ways so that we could try to find a connection between the nisayon that we're facing, keneged, the wrongdoing. And if after the objective chashbonot nefesh that we made, we still are having a hard time finding the correlation between the avera that we did and the consequence, then we could assume that Hashem allowed that event to take place, uh, uh, because there's free will in the world, and if we suffered as a result of that particular situation without cause, without cause, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will compensate us when He sees fit. The question is, what do we do with the times when the nisayon, when that which seems ra, when that which seems as evil, comes directly from Hashem and not because of someone else's bechira? For example, what if a doctor informs us that one of our children has a deadly disease? In that case, no one used his free will to hurt the child. So it seems that this horrible death sentence, this gzar din, is coming from the one who supposedly only does good. Which means that if a rasha hurt your child, chas v'shalom, you might not be able to forgive that rasha, but at least you'd know where to place the blame. You could put it on the faults of man, you could put it on the bechira of man, on the evil that sometimes man projects. But if you start to believe that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one who's causing your child pain, that's too much to bear. Yet we see how seemingly innocent children suffer all the time. And that could lead us to the question of how can a God who's supposed to be good be unkind? Chaz v'shalom. So this question of tzaddik veralo of why righteous people suffer was something Moshe Rabbeinu Shalom was also troubled by and he actually asked that question to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in Sefer Shemot. And the Gemara tells us that it's actually one of the very first times in the Torah HaKadoshah where this question of why the righteous suffer is addressed. So let's read the Pasuk in Sefer Shemot and analyze it and see what uh, we, make, we can make of it. Moshe Rabbeinu turns to Hashem and he says, Hareni na et kvodecha. Please grant me a vision of your glory. I want to know why you do what you do, Hashem. And Hashem answers Moshe saying, Ani avir kol tovi al panecha. I am going to cause all my goodness to pass before you. Vikarati Beshem Hashem Lefanecha. And I will proclaim the name of God in your presence. Vikanoti Asher Achon. 
וריחמתי אשר ארחם. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious to, and I will be compassionate to whom I will be compassionate to. And then Hashem says, Lo tuchal lirot et panai. You will not be able to see my presence. You won't be able to see my face. Ki lo yirani ha'adam v'chai. For man can not look upon me and live. Hinei makom iti. Behold, there is a place alongside me. Venitzavta al hatzur. And you should set yourself, and you shall set yourself on the rock. Vehaya ba'avor kevodi. And it shall be when my glory passes by. Vesamticha benikrat hatzur. I will place you into the cleft of the rock. Vesakotichapi alecha ad avri. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Vehasiroti et kapi. And then I will remove my hand. Veraita et achorai. And you will see my back. Ufanai lo yirau. But my face shall not be seen. Ladies, these are very powerful and mysterious words. What do they mean? Because many people who read these psukim think that Moshe Rabbeinu was asking, uh, uh, asking Hashem to know what he looks like. And obviously we know that that's not true. In Hashem's answer also, it seems that God is telling him that he won't reveal his face, but he will allow Moshe Rabbeinu to take a peek, so to speak, at his back. And of course we do realize that this is not literal. The Gemara of Brachot tells us that Moshe Rabbeinu obviously wasn't uh, asking to see God, so to speak. He knew better than that. He knew that Hashem doesn't have a material body or any kind of form. And therefore, God cannot be seen with human eyes. So what was Moshe Rabbeinu really asking of Hashem? Why did he ask to see God's glory? Chachamim explain that he wanted to understand Hashem's divine plan. He wanted to know how God decides what he decides and why he does what he does. In other words, Moshe Rabbeinu was telling Hashem, Hashem, I love you and I'm obedient to you. But there are things that I simply don't understand. When I see a child with an incurable illness who's going to die, when I see a little boy suffering and in so much pain and I know he's going to perish from this world at any moment, it's very hard for me to see what it is that you're doing. Can you please offer me the complete understanding of your ways so I can bestow upon you the full honor that you deserve? That's what Moshe Rabbeinu was telling Hashem. And it's very significant that these psukim appear immediately after Hashem's, Hashem forgives Am Yisrael for engaging in the sin of the golden calf. Think about it. Hashem orchestrated so many incredible miracles for the Jews while they were in Egypt. He led them out of bondage with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Bnei Israel witnessed countless miracles with their own eyes, including the splitting of the sea. Then, HaKadosh Baruch Hu spoke to the entire nation at Har Sinai. And when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to the mountain in order to retrieve the Torah, sadly, they repaid God's goodness and kindness by rejecting him and fashioning an idol? Now, Baruch Hashem, we did tshuva for that terrible avera. And Hashem not only forgave us, but He responded to us by describing His essence as being a God who is completely merciful and compassionate. And it's at this point when Moshe Rabbeinu chooses to make His request, as if to say, Hashem, if, if everything you're saying about your essence is true, that it's complete mercy and compassion, Hareni nat kvodecha. 
Can you please explain to me how your glory is manifested when there are children suffering? While the Rashaim are, are triumphing and prospering? Can you give me the gift of seeing and understanding how that makes sense? Which means that Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to know why bad things happen to good people and good things seemingly happen to bad people. And Hashem's answer contains in it what Moshe Rabbeinu and all of us want to know. So let's analyze Hashem's wording to see what it is HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling us. Let's begin. Hashem says, Ani avir kol tuvi al panecha. I will cause all my goodness to pass before you. Vekarati b'shem Hashem lefanecha. And I will proclaim the name of God in your presence. What does this mean? Ladies, if you remember in the first class, we learned about the names by which HaKadosh Baruch Hu identifies himself with in this world. And those names are very important. And in this Pasuk, Hashem uses the unique four-letter name, the name Havaya, which is pronounced Adonai, although it's spelled Yud, then a He, and then a Vav, and then another He. We learned that the name Havaya shows the kindness and compassion of God, whereas the name Elohim refers to Hashem's strict justice in this world. So in this Pasuk, the name that Hashem wants to divulge to Moshe is that of mercy. It's the name of Havaya. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Moshe, all of my goodness, all of it, is going to be testimony to my merciful quality. And what that means is that your perception of the pain and suffering you see might change once you see it all. Once you see the entire picture as I see it from where I sit. When you see it, you're going to have a different view. Ladies, seeing only half the story can lead a person to think that a Kadosh Baruch Hu is unkind, Chaz Shalom. But when we have a full view, when there's a complete viewpoint in front of us, we could maybe begin to understand why every strict judgment was really a necessary act of love. Once we're able to see and understand it all, the entire picture, we might just see the pain and suffering as a manifestation of Adonai, of Hashem's compassion and mercy. Then Hashem says, Vechanoti et asher achon, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. Verichamti et asher arachem, and I will be compassionate to whom I will be compassionate. What do you think Hashem is saying with these words? You think he's saying, I'm going to do whatever I want, regardless of whether or not it's just and fair? No, he's not saying that. What is Hashem saying? Vechanoti et asher achon. I'm going to be gracious to the one I decide to be gracious to, and not the one you think I should be gracious to. And I'm going to be compassionate to the one I want to be compassionate towards and not the one you think that I should be compassionate to. Ladies, the Gemara of Psachim teaches us that when a person is going to arrive to Olam Haba, he's going to see an Olam Hafuch. He's going to see an upside down world where those who were uh, on the bottom in this world and everybody thought of them in a very lowly fashion, didn't think much of them, might just be on top in very high levels in Olam Abba. And those who everybody thought here in this world they were good people, tzaddikim, on top of the game, on a high level, might be on a very low level in Shamaim after 120 years. But the point the Gemara is stressing is that quite often our opinion about who's a tzaddik and who's a rasha is only an opinion and it's not necessarily a fact. 
Chachamim are telling us that the manner in which human beings afford honor is literally olam hafuch, it's topsy-turvy. Very often we give kavod and we give attention to the wrong people and we neglect the people who truly deserve it. But only in olam ha'emet we're going to see who are the ones who were truly deserving of our kavod, our time and attention. The Holy Baal Shem Tov Alav HaShalom, the founder of the Hasidic movement, he explained this idea with an amazing story. He said there was once two Jews who were neighbors. One Jew was a tremendous scholar, Talmid Chacham. The other Jew was a poor man who worked all day long in order to make a living. Every day, the Talmid Chacham got up from his sleep very early in the morning and he went to shul, where the first thing that he did was study a page of Gemara. Then he directed his heart to Shamaim so that he could recite the tefillah of Shacharit slowly and with kavana, with tremendous intention. That man's tefillah was so drawn out that he didn't finish Shacharit until midday. The other man, the poor worker, also got up very early in the morning, but he went to work. He worked so hard in this back-breaking labor, straining his body and his soul, and he did that also until midday. And because of that, he had no time to go to shul and daven at the appropriate time. Every day when noon arrived, the Talmid Chacham left the shul to go, to home, to go home, and he felt uh, very good inside of him. He felt a sense of self-satisfaction and accomplishment because he busied himself with Torah and Tefillah and he felt he, felt he did the, the will of God. And on his way home from shul, he'd meet up with this poor neighbor who was rushing to go to shul and to daven whatever he could from Tefillah uh, Shacharit. And the poor neighbor, he felt so terrible and he regretted the fact that he just couldn't get to shul on time. Anyway, these two neighbors would pass each other. And when they did, the poor man would groan, a sorrowful groan, as if to show that he was so upset that his neighbor already managed to finish learning, finish davening, and he hadn't even begun. And this poor man thought to himself, what's gonna be with me, what's gonna be with me? I'm just now going to shul, and my neighbor already finished. You, I, I feel so bad, I feel so bad. But meanwhile, the Talmud Chacham's lips would curl up in a mocking way. And in his heart, he thought to himself, look at this, look at this. You see the difference between this lonely man and me? We both get up early in the morning. But I, I get up to serve you with Torah and Tefillah, while he, you know what, better not to talk, better not to talk. So the days, weeks, months and years passed by and these two men's lives were spent in this very different way where one had the freedom to learn Torah and daven early while the other slaved away in order to earn a, a meager living and he only made it to shul later that day. And of course they'd pass each other on the road and the Talmud Chacham would smirk while the poor man groaned. And eventually, after many years, both men passed away. And the Talmid Chacham was summoned before the Bed Din Shalmala in order to give a Din V'Chashbon of all his Ma'asim. The Bed Din asked, what have you done with the days of your years? And the Talmid Chacham smiled. He spoke with a lot of confidence. His voice was filled with pride. And he said, I'm thankful that all my days I served God. I learned so much Torah and I davened with a pure heart. But suddenly, the Satan, the Kategor, the heavenly prosecutor interjected and said, but I must point out to the judges that whenever he would meet his neighbor on the way to the synagogue, he'd mock him in his heart. Oh, 
all of a sudden a heavenly voice was heard saying, bring the scales. On one side of the scale, they put all this man's uh, a Torah, all the Torah that he learned, all the tefillot that he davened, while on the other side they put the, the smirks that hovered over his lips every single day when he met his neighbor, all the things that he thought in his heart. And guess what happened? The weight of the smirks weighed more than his learning and davening, and it whoop, tipped the scale to guilty. After the case of the Talmid Chacham ended, the Bet Din summoned the poor neighbor and they asked him, what have you done with the days of your years? And the poor man said, all my life I had to work hard in order to provide for my wife and for my children. Sadly, I didn't have time to daven with the tzibu at the right time, and I, and I feel badly that I didn't have time to learn more Torah than I should have because I had so many hungry mouths to feed. This time, the Sanego, the heavenly advocate, spoke up on this man's behalf and he said, But dear judges, I want to remind you that every day when this man met his neighbor, the Talmid Chacham, he groaned with pain from the depths of his soul because he felt that he didn't fulfill his obligation to God, he felt bad about it. And again, the scales were brought in. And guess what? The weight of this man's groans and his cries tipped the scale to innocent. Do you understand the point of the story? It's, it's a tremendous lesson, ladies, because the Rambam, Alava Shalom, makes this exact point in his Mishneh Torah. You could look it up. In Perek Gimel, Halacha Bet, he concludes that in Hashem's eyes, not in your eyes, not in the eyes of the people around you, in Hashem's eyes, a person's good deeds and his shortcomings are judged qualitatively and not quantitatively, which means, he writes, that it could very well be that one terrible avera that a person did, one terrible avel against his fellow man is going to outweigh a lifetime of ma'asim tovim, or the reverse, or the reverse. One special kind and good deed could erase many averot. Think about it. I mean, so many of us, we say, oh, I did so much, I, I always try to be kind, I always try to be generous, and I went above and beyond. And the Rambam says, yes, perhaps you did. Even though only Hashem knows if you went above and beyond, because only Hashem knows how much more you could have done. But let's say in the case that you're right, you did go above and beyond, according to Hashem, you're forgetting that then you went ahead and you did such a horrible act that caused everything that you did to be erased from your cheshbon and shamayim, from your account, your spiritual account. So the point the Rambam is making is that only Hashem truly knows what lies in every person's heart as well as the real value of your actions. Only a Kadosh Baruch Hu knows what's really going on in your spiritual bank account in Shemaim because only He knows which good deeds versus not such good deeds outweighed the other. You could think you did a lot. You could think you went above and beyond. But only Hashem knows the weight of the one action you didn't do or the one action you did terribly that demolished everything else you thought you did, and vice versa. Only Hashem knows all the things that you could have done right that you didn't, but then you went ahead and you did that one kind, virtuous, and compassionate act that erased all the other terrible things that went on. So, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Moshe Rabbeinu, V'rechamti et asher arachem, I will be compassionate to whom I will be compassionate. He was saying, I know better than you. 
who is truly righteous and who is behaving in terrible ways. Only I know who is truly deserving and who isn't. So don't try to improve upon my judgment because I'm the true judge. And then Hashem says, Lo tuchal lirot et panai. You will not be able to see my presence. You won't be able to see my face. Ki lo yirani ha'adam v'chai. For man cannot possibly look upon me and live. What exactly do these words mean? Well, well it seems that Moshe Rabbeinu wants to see he wants to understand Hashem's ways. But Hashem tells Moshe, Lo yirani ha'adam v'chai. That's the key word here. Hashem is saying, as long as you are alive, as long as you are chai, as long as you're living in this material world that's limiting your vision of chayim, of life, Lo yirani ha'adam, you'll never fully see my divine plan. Which means that the entire picture isn't visible to us from our limited perspective in this world. I mean, try to do this experiment. Try to press your nose to a beautiful painting. You know what you're going to see? In one place of the painting, you're going to see uh, uh, spots of the most beautiful royal blue. In another place, you're going to see a spot of black. While in another place, you're going to see a splash of white. In order for you to gain real perspective of the beauty of that painting, you need to step away in order to get a clear view of the entire canvas. And when you do, you know what you're going to realize? Oh, wait, wait a second. This painting wasn't about a bunch of blotches on a canvas. It looked so horrible as I was pressing my nose against it. It's a painting of the most beautiful flowers. Ladies, the same concept is true when it comes to understanding Hashem's plan and His ways. There are times we see the colorful parts and there are times we see the dark parts. But because we live in this world, which limits our view of the artwork, we don't have the ability to step back far enough to see the entire painting. In order to step back that far enough, you'd have to be in the next world, God forbid. And what that means is that our existence here on earth and our understanding of the real meaning of our lives is extremely limited. That was a Kadosh Baruch Hu's message to Moshe Rabbeinu. That was also the message that Hashem offered Eov, who was suffering and he wanted to understand Hashem's ways. What did Hashem tell Eov? He told him, the facts that are at your disposal in the world that you're living in aren't enough for the kind of knowledge that you want to possess. You don't have all the facts in this world of the living. And therefore, you'll never be able to arrive at the truth. So when HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Moshe, When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face shall not be seen. It's in this pasuk that the most important part of the answer was given. Because by telling Moshe that Moshe will not be able to see God's face, but only his back, Hashem was saying that it's going to be impossible for Moshe to understand events in this world as they are happening. But when we fast forward, in retrospect, it might be possible to make sense of what happened. Which means, that while you're in the midst of an Isayon, while you're in the eye of the storm, you're not going to be able to understand God's purpose or logic. But once the Nisayon has passed and you look back, it might be possible for you to begin to understand God's ways. Think about it. We all have situations in life that seemed very difficult and awful as we experienced them. But Later on, when we see it from 
a futuristic perspective, things may have turned out to be good. Think of the famous example of the man who is rushing to make it to the airport, suddenly gets a flat tire, the guy goes into a panic because he thinks he's going to miss his flight, he's very upset about this, he gets to the airport, lo and behold, he doesn't make the flight and he starts to get all annoyed, he's all angry. A few hours later, God forbid, he finds out that the plane crashed and those, everyone who was on board didn't make it. So the flat tire that he was so, so upset about turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Think about it. I mean, how many stories have we read about people who never made it to work on the day that the Twin Towers collapsed? For one reason or another, they never made it to work on that fateful morning. And what we learned from that is that everything that happens is ultimately for some good. So when we ask the question of why bad things happen to good people, we should know that we're making flawed assumptions because what we perceive as bad things may in fact be the best things that could happen to us. Think about it. Most people think that being poor, being ugly, and being helpless, powerless, is a bad thing, while having wealth, having beauty, and having power, that's a good thing. There are certain things we're sure of. But if you'd ask someone like Marilyn Monroe, you'd get another answer. She had money, she was beautiful, and her fame provided her with a lot of power. But for her, all those things only brought her misery, and eventually she committed suicide. So nobody could be sure of what's really good and what's really bad. We don't know the entire story because more than often we're only seeing half the picture and it might take years before the entire picture is made known to us. So with hindsight we begin to realize how the tragedies and difficulties in our life were perhaps blessings in disguise. Now of course when, when we're, we're in the middle of the Nisayon and, and people around us are telling us everything's going to be okay, everything, you're going to see everything's going to turn out for the best. We can't even hear it. We can't even hear it, much less understand it. The Zohar Kadosh states that when Kadosh Baruch Hu created the world, He declared it to be Tov Me'od, very good. But when we look at the world and world history, when we watch the news and we see all that suffering, it's very hard to agree with this divine judgment as being tov me'od. How is that tov me'od? How is that very good? How do you explain this? So the Zohar Kadosh points out that Hashem actually gives us a clue in the name that He chose for the first man, Adam. In Hebrew, Adam is spelled Aleph, Dalet, Mem, Adam. But those are the same letters as the word me'od, me'od, which is spelled mem, aleph, dalet. And that's quite interesting, that's quite interesting. Also, the Zohar Kadosh says, the Tarashetevot of the name Adam actually stands for the three milestones of human history. Aleph, which is the first letter of the Aleph Bet, represents the very beginning of the story of mankind, starting with Adam. Dalet represents David HaMelech, the king of Israel, which signifies the high point in Jewish history. And the letter Mem stands for Mashiach, who's going to bring the world to its ultimate state of fulfillment. So Abi Shimon Bar Yochai Alava Shalom is teaching us that when we finally are going to reach that stage of history alluded to by the Mem in the word Adam, which is the days of Mashiach, that's when we're going to be able to look at everything that happened before, throughout the course of history, from the Aleph of Adam through the Dalet of David. And then together with Hashem, 
we're going to be able to proclaim that what happened here from Aleph through Mem was not only Tov, but it was Tov Me'od. It was very good. There was, a, there was a famous philosopher who said it very well. He said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forward. So the exchange between Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu teaches us to beware of assumptions that are incomplete and faulty. Assumptions that lead us to the question of God's goodness. We have to be careful with that. So when Moshe Rabbeinu told Hashem, Hashem, I want to honor you completely, but my lack of understanding of your ways is getting in my way. How can I honor you completely when I see good people who have it bad and bad people who have it good? Hashem says, wait a minute, Moshe. And I have an issue with two premises of yours. Number one, don't be so quick when you call some people good and other people bad because you don't know for certain who's who. The truth of who really is good and who really is not so good, that truth lies only in my domain. That's number one. Number two, when you say they have it bad and those people have it good, are you sure your definitions of good and bad are correct? Are you sure you know what you're referring to? Do you know really what good is and what bad is? Because in reality, you're not so sure. And you can't be so sure because you cannot see my face. You can't judge things as they're taking place in a person's life. You'll only be able to see it in retrospect. In retrospect, terrible things could actually be divine guidance, the best thing. And sometimes it's going to take years for you to see it. Sometimes you might not ever see it, at least not while you're still living in this world. And that's very important, ladies. That's very important, ladies. The problem is that there are many times when even in retrospect, there's not that much clarity that we gain. Which means that even though it's true that looking back at a situation can become very enlightening, you can then understand looking back why certain things had to happen the way they did, it can often leave us with many unresolved questions because not always do we gain the clarity that we want to gain as time passes by. So what do we do then? What do we do then? Does that mean that we're going to leave this world with problems that were not resolved? With pain that won't be healed? With cruelties never to be explained? And injustices never to be set right? I mean, it's easy to say, okay, so he lost his job. Is that the shem? He'll find a new job that he'll feel better about, that'll be much better for him. So it's not so bad that he lost his job. When you're, when you're watching a young child slowly, God forbid, dying from cancer, suffering with every breath, it's not so easy to have that kind of attitude. It's very hard to say, you know what, this too is for the good. Gamzet tov me'od. Think of the mother of that child. She might say, what do you mean? I mean, my child got sick and remained sick for the rest of his days, and then he died. So where's the good in that? Don't tell me to wait for the end of the story. I saw the end of the story. The end of the story is that my child died. What can we reply to these words? What do we say? The only thing we can say is what Hashem tells us. Lo yir'ani ha'adam v'chai. Man cannot see me and live. Which means we don't have the entire picture even at the time of death. Death is the gateway to another world beyond this world. So Hashem tells us, what's still unclear during your finite existence on earth will only be possible for you to understand once you're blessed with the divine perspective of eternity. Eternity is not in this world, it's in the next. 
Someone who's mourning the loss of a loved one will have a very difficult time viewing death in any positive light because for that person it represents an excruciating loss. For the one who remains behind in this material world, it's very hard to comprehend and accept Hashem's divine plan. But for the one who died, for them, death is not a problem, but rather the answers to that person's life. For that person, his emergence into a new world alongside his maker is the beginning of all the answers to his life. And we're going to see how that's possible in the next Shiur Bezat Hashem. I want to wish you all a Shavua Tov, Chodesh Tov Mevorach. You know, we're just days away from Chodesh Av. And although the, the first part of the month is about mourning and destruction, we should try to remember that the name of this coming month is Av. Av means father. Our father wants us to understand why it is that we're mourning, why there was a destruction, and most importantly, what we could do to build again and to see our way through the darkness and into the light of the final redemption. Amen ken, yiratzon. <laughs>